All right, let's get this, let's get the party started. Welcome, Heli Toe. My name is Shannon O'Loughlin. I'm a citizen of the Choctaw Nation of Oklahoma and uh, the proud CEO and attorney for the association that's 100 years old. I, rem I used to work for the association, you know, before I was a CEO, I, I used to provide pro bono legal service and do work with Jack Trope and others on special projects. And, and I was always surprised how so many, how so few people knew the work of the Association on American Indian Affairs. And I think uh, they've been around so long and so much of the work that they do is grassroots on the ground with tribes hand in hand. Uh, they were never much of sharing all of those work and all of the stories that were, uh, were being told. And so what we're doing at our 100 year anniversary right now is going back in time and making sure that we're capturing those stories because we have all of our archives are in Princeton Mud Library. So we have historians and others going back and looking and uh, we have engaged uh, Matthew Fletcher, if some of you know who Matthew Fletcher is. Um, he's a, a prominent uh, Indian law scholar and attorney uh, who will be writing our 100 year history uh, which will go over the various area, eras of federal Indian law and policy and, and connect how the association really was the, the pusher uh, to change the way Congress and others thought about federal Indian affairs, law and policy. Uh, so I'm really proud to be a part of the association and looking forward to our next 100 years of service to Indian country and our plan is we want to put ourselves out of business, right? We want the world to be a place where diverse Native American cultures and values are lived, protected, and respected. So we want to put ourselves out of a job. We want a world that, that manifests that so that we don't have to be here, you know, pointing fingers and, and, and uh, uh, helping educate those people over and over again, those policymakers and lawmakers about uh, the importance of protecting our, our culture and our sovereignty. So let me give you some logistics this morning. That was my little pep talk, I guess. <laughs> uh, and my hair is a little different today. How, does it look okay? All right, okay, cool. Um, I wanted to let you know that um, uh, Melanie O'Brien left some extra flyers that I'm going to leave out on um, the NAGPRA Community of Practice table and the IMLS table out there. Um, it's a quick guide for preserving Native American cultural resources. I don't like that word resources. Our culture is not a resource. Um, uh, and what is NAGPRA? Who must comply with NAGPRA? So it's a really good summarized how-to uh, 101 about NAGPRA. So I'm gonna leave that out on the desk for anyone who, who wants that. I also want to remind you that we have no shirts for sale anymore. You'll have to go online and order your shirt. Please do so by October 28th. And don't forget, we still have raffle tickets for sale out there. And our, our uh, raffle items keep growing and growing. So don't forget to check the table out. Um, sorry that you out there on Zoom are unable to participate. But you can always go to our website and hit the donate button. And, and we will send you our virtual love, um, but unable to send you a raffle ticket. Uh, let's see, what else have I got? There's still meeting rooms back there, so if anyone needs to have private conversations or have a discussion, please go ahead and you can take it to the back there. Um, is there anything that I'm missing? CC, Colleen, what have I missed? Survey. Oh, yes. Thank you for the surveys you filled out at the end of the day yesterday. Same goes to you out there in Zoom, Zoom land. Um, remember, at the end of the day today, you have those surveys um, uh, at your tables there. And for those on Zoom, you'll be able to access the Zoom survey at the very last session in the Zoom portal. Okay, let me just quit there while I'm ahead. I wanna make sure you all thank 
everyone from the Bokagan Band and from Four Winds Casino who has been helping us. You all have been so amazing, so friendly, so wonderful. Let's give everyone a round of applause for the great, great work. Thank you. And of course, for the, the graciousness of the Pekagan Band of, of Potawatomi Indians for um, supporting this conference. And our, all of our wonderful sponsors who, who are supporting uh, getting free registrations and uh, getting people to the conference. So without further ado, um, I am a little bit uh, awestruck and, you know, kind of in the, the fan girl thing here with our next uh, our, our keynote speaker, I'm a little bit of a nerd. Um, uh, this is her book, Origin, Dr. Jennifer Raff. She's an associate professor and director of graduate studies in anthropology, and she has a dual PhD in anthropology, anthropology and genetics. So she's, you know, a little bit of a brainiac here. Um, she's also affiliate faculty with indigenous studies at uh, University of Kansas. Uh, in Lawrence, right? And uh, she is a prolific writer on genetics, and she authored this wonderful book, which is, uh, really gives all of us access to the mind of a geneticist in Indian country, right? In a good way, and not in the way that we're used to. And I wanted to read you a little, pa uh, a little passage because I think it will really get you into the mindset of who Dr. Jennifer Raff is and why we ask her to be a part of our conference today. She's talking about, she's going through this kind of ritual to be in her lab to study DNA and all the different things that she has to go through to make sure she's clean and the whole space around her is really a sacred space. And she says, this mindfulness is crucial. The human remains in those drawers hold a tremendous amount of significance. And not simply in terms of scientific discovery. These remains represent an acknowledgement to accept responsibility for past transgressions and unscrupulous methodologies to accept responsibility for preconceived assumptions about race and societies, which resulted in cultural erasures and persisting prejudices. We have promised to treat the small scraps of bone and teeth with respect and mindfulness that they are cherished ancestors, not specimens, who have been entrusted to us to handle with the reverence they deserve in death. The remains in our lab are the result of a contract between ourselves and the indigenous peoples who have given us permission to conduct this work. For the early career scientists working now and the scientists they will train in the future to transform the fields of anthropology and genetics, imbuing them with better ethical practices and a greater respect for human dignity, I want to introduce uh, Dr. Jennifer Raff to be our keynote speaker today. Welcome. Now I just have to like get this going here. Let's see if this works. It's been a little particular. <laughs> Did someone smudge the computers? Okay, here we go. Thank you so much. I am so honored to be at this conference. Um, I've been learning a ton and having some great conversations, um, and I hope these will continue. Um, I, so I want to first say hello to everybody here and everybody on Zoom. I know I have a lot of people I know here. I'm very surprised. Um, and also on Zoom, some people from my own institution are, are watching, so hi. <laughs> um, so before I really start the presentation, I wanted to um, note that at my own institution, the University of Kansas, we're currently working through a repatriation. And I'll save the details for later conversation, but um, one thing I did want to mention is how different things are now than they were even just a few years ago. So I'm not really directly involved with this process except in the case of one ancestor, but 
I'm close enough to the process that I can see the range of responses by faculty and administrators, and it seems to me that everybody is taking the same perspective. Care for the ancestors, what do they need? How can we return them in a respectful and appropriate way? How can we take care of the students, the indigenous students and the faculty? Um, and how do we bring awareness and attention to the, and resources to addressing these injustices um, towards Native peoples, um, both on campus and across the region. And this is a major shift from what I've seen, um, as my, some of my colleagues can tell you. Uh, we've been reminiscing about the bad old days and talking about how things have changed. And I wanna say that I attribute this change and this awareness from what I've seen in the past at my institution, at other institutions, to the efforts of activists and educators like yourselves. So your work, your work matters. It's making an impact, it's a big impact. And I see this at my institutions, I see this across my discipline, and I see this in other spaces. And so I just wanted to say thank you and I hope that, that you take from this um, that appreciation. So when Shannon invited me to come speak, um, I had about a million ideas for what I might talk about. Um, but I settled, on, I settled on one, which is what do you, as tribal representatives, as TIPOs, as repatriation specialists, as um, archaeologists or consultants, what do you need to know about ancient DNA and paleogenetics? and what could help you in your important work in caring for the ancestors. So in this talk, I'm gonna to try to do a couple of things. Um, first, I wanna provide everyone here with a very basic under introduction to genetics and paleogenetics, and I'm gonna try not to put you to sleep. I know this is very dry. I will do my best, I will keep it light. Um, Jargon-free, I hope. Um, and then second, I'm gonna go into the kinds of things that ancient DNA can tell you and what it can't. Um, whoops, I just flipped a few slides here. Okay, and then um, I'm also going to then, so I wanna give you kind of a perspective on this in case you're interested in the possibility of, exp of using ancient DNA as a tool for understanding the past, um, but you might find it's not useful to you or your community's needs. Um, but regardless, I think it's important that everybody starts with the same baseline of knowledge. Um, because you're gonna have people, if you haven't already, approach you and talk to you about this and ask you, what about ancient DNA? And I, I think that one of my um, main missions in my career is to build capacity in tribes for understanding um, what you can do with, with this tool. Um, I'm also gonna, and then I'm gonna close by kind of going through a list of considerations and ethical issues to keep in mind. And usually I give this talk to geneticists and to archeologists who are non-native. And so it's gonna be fun for me to kind of flip this and talk to, to tribes and tribal officials um, and give you the other, the other side of it. Um, this is gonna be a very general introduction and I'll be around the rest of the day to have conversations with folks if you have more questions. Um, and I wanna give you a little bit of a content warning. I will be talking a bit about the process of retrieving ancient DNA from ancestors' remains. Um, and this discussion will occur after I talk about mitochondrial and nuclear DNA and the differences between them. And then towards the end of the process, I will very briefly touch on a few cases uh, regarding ancestors. Um, and some cases where they haven't been treated well. But I will not be showing any photographs, of course. So also before I begin, I wanna stress that what I'm gonna be presenting here, especially the discussions regarding ethics, is not my work. <laughs> this is the foundation, this is built on the foundation of scholarships of many native and non-native uh, scholars. Um, their work and their leadership has informed my understanding of these issues, and I have come a long way in this, in this journey. So much about what I talk about in this presentation and what I talk about in my book is from both academic and public scholarship. Um, and these are some of the people, but not all, whose work has uh, influenced my thinking. I'm just trying to apply the lessons that I have learned and then bring what um, I understand to be their main points to the public. Um, that's kind of my, um, my mission. Okay, so my interest is in genetics and mostly in how genomes can, from ancestors can tell us about the past. As you may know, paleogenomics, which is what this field is called sometimes, 
um, has been gaining a lot of attention in the media in recent years. Uh, Svante Pabo has just received the Nobel Prize for um, medicine, uh, and, um, he, uh, and he is the one who basically founded the field and developed a lot of the techniques that we use today. This is not just hype. It's not just some fancy, shiny new tool. This is, this is legitimately a major, major move forward um, because ancient, ancient genomes give us an extraordinary understanding and powerful way to understand the past and to understand specifically the biological histories of humans, of non-humans, of entire ecosystems. And so I think it's really important that everybody understand at least a little bit about this tool. Over the last decade or two, genomic approaches have been increasingly common in investigating population histories specifically about the, the Americas, about the indigenous peoples of the Americas, um, uh, non-humans and humans. Um, and this body of research has given us some really important scientific insights into that history. A lot of them, as I write about in my book, have overturned um, previous archaeological theories about how the Americas were peopled, how in indigenous peoples are related to one another. Um, it, it helps us understand the similarities and differences between us. Um, this has really captured the public imagination, and we can, with varying degrees of difficulty now, sequence entire genomes and get an understanding of biological relationships between individuals in the present and in the past at the highest level of resolution it is possible to obtain. So this gives us really powerful insights into ancient history. Um, and so we can test, as I'll talk about later in this talk, questions that are small scale, such as the relationship between two ancestors buried together, or larger scale, such as the relationships between populations across a continent. And even relationships between anatomically modern humans like us, anatomically modern, and um, Denisovans and Neanderthals, our cousins. Um, Okay, um, and we can also even learn about things like tuberculosis and, and other infectious diseases and where they came from. And we can learn about the relationships between non-humans and humans, for example, dogs, and how they are related to the indigenous peoples and the populations with whom they traveled and lived. Of special interest gathered, to those of us gathered here today, um, DNA can also be used as a tool for repatriation. And as I was working on this talk, I became aware of this article from The New Yorker. Um, maybe you have seen it already. Um, and it's discussing the abysmal situation regarding ancestral remains um, in Texas and mortuary items in Texas. And one scientist's efforts to repatriate an ancestor using DNA evidence to connect her to a lineal descendant. Actually, it's two ancestors. Um, whoops. But as this article notes, there are some incredibly complex ethical issues surrounding this effort and retrieving and studying DNA from ancestors in general. So like any other tool, paleogenomics can be used for good purposes, it can be used for bad purposes, it can be positive and empowering, or it can have unintended harmful consequences even when it's employed by people who are well-meaning and well-intentioned. So I kind of want to talk about that today. But first, let me give you a little background. I'm assuming that most people in here are not geneticists or have, don't have a whole lot of genetics experience, but if you do, you can just kind of fall asleep for the next few slides, because <laughs> this will be pretty, this will be, you'll, under, you'll know this already. Um, so DNA, like I said, it can tell us about the biological relationships between individuals living in the present and the past. So the human genome is an archive of population history. So the evolutionary forces that act on us and all life on Earth natural selection, genetic drift, migration, um, mutation, these all change the genetic composition of populations over time. And using the tools of population genetics, we can actually reconstruct what happened in the past. And these are just kind of some of the topics that you can understand with it. So when reconstructing population histories, geneticists rely on different aspects of the genome. So mitochondrial DNA um, is present in the mitochondria of your cell. Those are the little organelles that generate ATP, the power that drives your cell, that drives your body. They're the energy-producing factories. They have their own genome for interesting reasons. 
Um, this is separate from the genome found in the chromosomes in your nucleus. And mitochondrial DNA is maternally inherited, so it's present. Your, your mitochondrial lineage is the same as your mother's and her mother's and her mother's and her mother's all the way back with a few changes here and there from time to time, but it is a, it is a record of maternal population history. Mitochondrial DNA is also present in hundreds to thousands of copies per cell, which is really good when you're talking about ancient DNA, which is usually scarce, degraded, fragmented, damaged, um, and so many more um, ancient DNA studies are based on mitochondrial DNA than on the other kinds that I'll talk about in a second. But mitochondrial DNA only gives information about a subset of your lineage, about a subset of your ancestors. And this will give you an accurate but incomplete picture. Um, and so the way I, I think about it and the way I write about it in my book is that this is akin to a puzzle. You're trying to uncover the past by putting a puzzle together. Mitochondrial DNA gives you basically the edge pieces of the puzzle. So you can understand what happened, but not the details. To get a more detailed picture, you need to examine nuclear DNA, which is the DNA found in your chromosomes. And so there are 16,500 DNA bases, A, G's, T's and C's in your mitochondrial genome. There are 3.1 billion DNA bases in just one half of your nuclear genome. Um, that's about 30, 20 to 30,000 genes. That's a lot. <laughs> so unlike mitochondrial DNA though, nuclear DNA is present only in two copies per cell. So you have one set from your, of chromosomes from your mom, one set of chromosomes from your dad, and so it's much less abundant in human cells and it's much more difficult to retrieve from ancient ancestors. But it's a vastly more powerful tool for understanding the past. And so this is why in recent years you have been seeing so many more studies coming out that give us these new insights and that's based primarily on um, ancient nuclear DNA. Because the nuclear genome is inherited from both parents, and so it reflects the history of many, the histories, I should say, of many ancestors, not just those on your maternal lineage, giving you millions and millions of puzzle pieces that include the, the middle pieces of the puzzle. Okay, so in the next few slides, I'm gonna take you very quickly through the process of ancient DNA recovery, sequencing, and analysis. I'm gonna go fast because this can get very technical and I don't really wanna get technical. Uh, we can save those details. If you wanna nerd out with me later, we can talk more in more detail. All right, so here's how this goes. We first take a sample from the ancestor, and this can be either a small bit of bone or tooth or hair. Um, we can also obtain DNA from soil, and, some, and sometimes from artifacts, the, the, the processes are not very well developed for that, but um, they're getting better. So the amount needed is 50 milligrams, and that's the approximate equivalent of a pinch of powder um, for each extraction. So that much disturbance of an ancestor's remains may be unex completely unacceptable, is completely unacceptable for some descendants. Um, so that, that alone takes it off the table. There are some um, methods for trying to get ancient DNA from without destructive analysis, without actually taking that powder sample, but they're a little bit unreliable. So for those communities, descendant communities who are okay with this process, with this, um, this DNA retrieval process, I'm gonna move on to the next steps in the process. So the sample from the ancestor is treated to remove any contaminating DNA from the people who may have touched it, for example, people in museums or, or, or whatever. Um, and then it is chemically treated, which releases DNA from the, the sample, and um, we move on with that to the next step. So you basically come out of it with a little tube full of liquid that has DNA in it. We take that resulting liquid that contains the ancestor's DNA and run it through a column that contains silica. So DNA binds to silica under certain conditions and that allows us to wash it with multiple buffers um, to clean away the soil um, chemicals and any other chemicals that might be there that could uh, interfere with the sequencing process. And then we wash the DNA again and we, then we remove it from the column. 
So at this stage, we hopefully have a tube full of millions and millions of DNA fragments like this. I, can you see my cursor? You cannot see my cursor. Okay, never mind. Um, so the vast majority of these DNA fragments in this little tube will not belong to the ancestor. They will belong to the soil bacteria that we co-extract. So you can't, you know, be specific about that. Um, so at this stage of the process, we do some quality control work to decide to figure out how much of the DNA in this tube is from the ancestor. We call that endogenous DNA and how much of it is from other sources. Depending on how much endogenous DNA we have, we can either just sequence it outright and just sequence the whole genome, or we can use a technique to pull out specific bits of the DNA to, want to, to study. Um, we, call, we fish for the DNA using baits, um, which are predetermined DNA sequences that will bind and pull out that DNA. This is called target capture. Um, first, I'll talk about shotgun sequencing very quickly. Um, I'm gonna just gloss right through this, but basically the process is the DNA fragments are bound to adapters. You create a library of all the DNA fragments there that have these chemical tags attached to them that allow you to study them. <laughs> um, and then we use these this chemistry process um, that allows us to sequence the, the A's, G's, T's, and C's of every single fragment in that library. That is a lot of data, and we'll come back to data in a minute. Um, but this requires, to do this and get the entire genome, it requires a lot of DNA to be present in that ancestor. Most do not have this degree of preservation, so we can take this other approach, this target capture approach. So we fish for the DNA using these specially designed baits and they match these spots across the genome and allow us to get information from ancestors who did not have as much DNA preserved. However it's done, the DNA is then, um, the DNA sequences that we get give us a literal readout of all the A's, G's, T's, and C's in that genome, but they're in a bazillion different random fragments, and so they have to be sorted um, bioinformatically um, using computer stuff that I don't do this part. I don't understand this part very well, so I hand it off to a collaborator and they, they do this part for me. Um, and they will assemble these bazillion fragments into order using a human genome as a reference or whatever organism you are studying. Could be a dog, could be a bacterium, whatever. And they will then assemble them in order using that as a reference. Once you have the genome assembled from all these fragments, then you can begin to analyze it. Again, this is the part I don't really do, um, but there are a lot of population genetics methods and programs that will help you ascertain relationships between ancestors um, and between ancestors and descendant populations, test different ideas, different hypotheses about the past. Um, just to give you one example, this is a tool that we call principal components analysis, which gives you a visual depiction of the genetic relationships. So the closer together two of these spots are on this picture, the more closely related those two individuals are. So this one is showing the genome of an ancient Siberian called Malta, who I write, wrote about in my book. Um, and it also gives us a, it compares Malta to different populations. So we have Europeans here, Central and South Asians, Oceanans, Siberians, East Asians, and here are Native Americans um, in purple. So one thing about PCAs, and I could do a whole talk on this, but I won't. Um, is that the genomes that are included in PCAs, principal component analyses, are included because they cluster nicely and distinctly. So if we were to include a genome from every single person, these clusters would not be distinct. <laughs> they would be much more spread out. So I want you to understand this. Um, these are not accurate re reflections of racial groupings. Um, so a lot of people, a lot of geneticists don't understand how much this is misunderstood. They assume, oh, we, everybody understands how we make these methods. But PCAs like this are sometimes used to claim, to assert that there is a biological basis for race. They'll say, look at these clusters. Obviously, these are racial groupings. It's not true. It's not true. It's only distinct because we have removed the individuals who don't cluster very nicely so that we can study the ones who do. Um, anyway, ask me about this later if you want some more um, information about that. 
Okay, so there are two complications to, I don't want to call them issues, but two concerns about ancient DNA recovery. So the first, as I've mentioned earlier, is that the process of recovering ancient DNA always, almost always, involves disturbance of an ancestor's remains. Um, the DNA extraction process usually results in the destruction of a small sample of the remain, usually a tooth or bone, could be hair. Um, and as I said, there are non-destructive methods available, but they're not very reliable. Um, so this fact alone takes ancient DNA research completely off the table for a lot of communities. Um, and, and one of the things that I found <laughs> that some non-native geneticists struggle with is hearing no <laughs> from tribes. And I have to go and tell them, you, you must respect that. That is very important. Um, but this is by no means true for all communities. So um, some want to use ancient DNA approaches to understanding the past. Some want to learn what they can from the ancestors' DNA. Um, these are the communities that I work with. I'm not actually going to talk specifically about them in this presentation, but a lot of what I, the work I do informs, is informing this talk as well. But this is still not a simple matter. So because ancient DNA is so degraded and so fragmented, it's very sensitive to contamination from living people, from our DNA. Um, and that's because our DNA is abundant, our DNA is intact. Um, and so aside from exceptional cases, the majority of ancient ancestors' DNA is not preserved well enough to study. Um, so just to put it simply, some ancestors have DNA that's available to learn and study from, or study and learn from, and some do not. We don't necessarily, actually I would say most do not, we don't necessarily know in advance who, whose DNA is going to be preserved and whose is not. That's um, difficult. Studying ancient DNA is also extremely expensive. Um, and if you are not one of the gigantic, the few gigantic lab groups that seem to have infinite resources, and personnel, I'm a little bitter. Yes, my lab is not one of them. Um, this work takes a long time because you have to secure funding, grant funding from um, organizations, you, and then your personnel take a long time to work on it. So for those of my, my community partners who are here and are like, where's our, where's our results? We're still working on them. Um, it takes a long time. I, I mean years and years. And so this might be a factor in your decision to work with a particular lab group or not. The small lab groups like mine are going to take a really long time. Um, it is very technically challenging to take all the precautions necessary to ensure that DNA from an ancient individual is uncontaminated by our own DNA. There are not that many labs across the country that can do this. This is a picture of the inside of our lab and one of our researchers, I don't know who that is, <laughs> uh, one of the graduate students I think who's extracting DNA from I think soil um, or it might be uh, DNA from a dog. I'm not sure, it's not a, not a human. Um, and this gives you an idea of what it takes to work in this space. You have to put on a lot of um, Clo protective clothing, you have to actually literally spray the outside of your clothing with bleach. Um, you have to take a lot of precautions. Uh, and I kind of wrote an entire chapter in my book about this, which uh, Shannon quoted from. If you are really interested in this, I would um, contact me. I'd be happy to send you that chapter so you could read it. OK, so as of last year, these are the number of ancestors' genomes which have been characterized um, I, through one of the methods that I talked about. And I want you to notice the gaps. There are a lot of them, both in time and in space. And these gaps are due to the complicated factors that I've talked about, the sacredness of DNA from ancestors' remains, the scarcity of preserved ancient DNA, the few labs that are actually equipped to do this work. Um, but these gaps also reflect the very understandable reluctance of tribes and communities to give consent for this research. Um, oops. This is, this is the result of our field, my field's historic and ongoing um, abusive research practices and has resulted in a lack of trust. And we have earned that lack of trust. I mean, I'm going to be blunt about it. We have. And far too often, indigenous people's wishes have been um, violated in the pursuit of scientific knowledge. And there is a very long history of this. I don't have to tell you this. You know this already. Um, so 
uh, what can what can we as scientists do? I talk about this all the time. It is a process of relationship building. It is a process of earning that trust. And that means seeding control, seeding power, not doing the research just for its own sake, just for the sake of knowledge, but doing it on behalf of tribes rather than at their expense. Okay, um, I'll get back to that in a bit. <laughs> so what can, yes? Oh, I'm so sorry. Yeah, I don't have a pointer here, but um, so on the left, these are, um, these bubbles are pictures, are, are ancient genomes, and the larger the bubble, the more genomes that have been um, sequenced from that region. So on the very far left, these are the genomes that date between 12,800 and 8,000 years before present. In the middle, eight th between 8,000 and 4,000 years before present. And on the right, less, uh, more recently than 4,000 years ago. And on the far, far right, that column shows you the number of individuals who have been included in those studies. And the color is based on which method, genome-wide capture or whole sh genome shotgun sequencing. Yes, yes, yeah, I'm sorry, I should have explained that more carefully. <laughs> yeah, thank you. All right, so the next part of the talk, what specifically can ancient DNA tell us? Um, let's say that we are interested in an event that happened in the past. Let's say, for example, your ancestors um, became farm, you know, intent, they, they switched to farming, um, they switched the, their, their uh, cultural practices to farming, and you're interested in their farming, how, does, how did that affect their population sizes, how did that affect the people coming into or out of the community, you know, how did that affect the population biologically? So one approach to studying that question is to sample the genetic diversity of descendant populations um, in the present, and this is, technically very easy to do. Um, it has its own specific set of ethical issues, which you know I can talk about. Um, I was focused mostly on ancient DNA for this talk, but uh, so I won't get into it, but there are careful considerations that need to be um, taken into account for that. But modern DNA, DNA from living people, can only provide indirect uh, glimpses of the past. So the signal of any events that occurred in the past in theory is archived in the genomes of descendant populations, but it might be obscured by more recent population events, such as a migration of people into or out of the area, one example being um, settler colonialism and the impact of European colonization, which we know impacted indigenous peoples in profound ways. How has that obscured the, our ability to understand the past in a genetic and a biological way? So ancient DNA can give us a window into past populations. So we know that at this time, which we can date with radiocarbon methods, we know these genetic variants were present in this population at this geographic location. So it lets us localize these, this information. Combining the study of ancient genomes and contemporary peoples really, as some, some people do, including myself, really gives us the most robust, accurate models. We can look at history through a very, very long range of time and address a lot of different questions. Okay, so DNA can tell us some things. DNA cannot tell us others. So DNA can allow us to estimate past population sizes with some caveats. Um, it can give us so uh, insights into sources of ancestry. Did your ancestors have themselves have ancestry from this population and this population? Or did they have some from an entirely different population that we you know, may not have realized? Um, we can look at demographic events. We can uh, calculate approximate dates for these demographic events, again with some caveats. But there are some things DNA cannot tell us. In general, it cannot tell us the location of events unless there's some pretty tight connection with, a, with archaeological records. Um, it can be very tricky. It cannot tell us the difference between two populations if they are or were genetically very similar to each other does not tell us anything about behavior and identity, and it does not tell us about tribal affiliation. That's a big one. Um, and I think that I don't have to explain that to you, um, the, the mixing and connections between tribes and peoples. Um, I often have to tell this to non-native audiences. I have to explain it very thoroughly. 
but uh, for, I'm going to just leave it at that. I, don't, I can talk about it more if you'd like. So there are some questions that we can get at different scales. So big, big scales. How, what is the overall genetic history of a community? How is a community related to other ancient and contemporary communities across the Americas? And how does that history connect with the broader history of native peoples in the Americas? We can ask smaller scale questions. So specifically, in a specific community, what's the relationship in the history between ancestors and present day descendants? Was there, for example, gene flow or marriage um, between different groups across the region or from outside the region? Um, that can be very interesting archeologically. Um, and, and again, how did it contact with Europeans? How did European colonization and the genocides that they perpet perpetrated impact these groups genetically? So uh, just to give you one very quick example, this is work I did as a postdoc um, in the Arctic, um, looking at genetic variations in communities across the North Slope of Alaska. This is from contemporary populations, but um, there, we also did work on their ancestors as well, of course, with permission. Um, and we detected very distinctive pattern of shared maternal lineages across the villages along the North Slope. So that's represented by these lines. The different colors represent different maternal lineages. Um, and an elder in the community looked at these results and was able to interpret them for us and explained that, well, women traveled frequently by Umiak along the coastline more so than they did into interior Alaska. And, and of course that made sense. So I thought that was really neat. We can also ask questions about individuals. So the genetic relationships between ancestors buried at a single site. We can ask, did an ancestor have a particular pathogen, um, a particular, like for example, tuberculosis or um, other pathogens? Um, and what were the diets of different ancestors like? We can get at that more with stable isotope analysis, but we can get at that question. Okay. so. Wrapping up this talk, it, whether you're an elder or a typo or repatriation specialist or an archaeologist, you may at some point get asked for permission to do ancient DNA um, research on your ancestors. You may already have been asked to do this. Um, so I just want to go through a few issues. I think it's really important for communities to consider when they're faced with this prospect or if you're already, if you're kind of thinking about whether or not you want to do that proactively. Um, there is no one-size-fits-all model. Every tribe has different needs and priorities. Um, but there, there are some common issues. So first, there is an intense discussion right now, intense, about the ethics of paleogenomics research in the um, academic literature. There are a lot of ethical frameworks out there. There are good ones, driven by indigenous researchers, and bioethicists, and allies who are very experienced in community-based participatory research. There are some not so good ones out there. Um, in the interest of time, I'm just gonna focus on the good ones. Uh, I will say this about the not so good ones. Try not to get myself in trouble here. Expertise in ancient DNA does not make you an expert on bioethics. And I include myself in that category. I am not an expert on bioethics. Um, Danae geneticist and bioethicist Crystal Sosi, who is amazing, she pointed out on Twitter, uh, which is where we have lots of these discussions, um, that being a paleogeneticist creates a conflict of interest when it comes to ethics, because we benefit from the research products, and she is absolutely right. So I'll just say, I'll just leave that there. Okay, so the first consideration is consultation. How would the tribe like to be consulted? This is different in every project I am involved with. Sometimes I work with lawyers representing the tribe. Sometimes I work with a specific elder who has been designated as the tribal point of, as my point of contact with the tribe. Sometimes I work with multiple people. Um, from my perspective, as an outsider, it is really helpful to have that structure in place to have that very clear, who do I go to when I am reporting results? Who do I go to when I have questions? How often do you want updates? Do you want them yearly, yearly presentations? Do you want updates on research as results come in? Um, what should that consultation process look like? The research design is another big question and I, think it is very helpful for tribes to figure this out in advance, at least what their priorities are. Because when I go to a tribe, I will um, come to them with their specific questions I might be interested in, but I want to know what they're interested in. What 
do you want to know about the past? What do you want to know about these ancestors? Um, and we build both sets of questions into the research design, unless the tribe does not like my questions. If they don't want to address the same kinds of questions that I want to do, we take those off the table. And that is your right, and you should absolutely insist on it. Um, and these are things that researchers collecting the DNA need to be talking to tribes about, but also you need to think about the people who will use the results in later research. What do you think it is okay for them to study? Um, is it okay to do medical related research or just historical research? Or maybe you want to do medical research but not historical research. Um, so thinking about these things and, and being very clear about what you are interested in is very, very helpful. So I just want to highlight one particular issue that you might want to keep in mind. Um, so we can use genomes from ancestors to tell us about population origins and movement. And for some tribes, there can be a cultural risk associated with this kind of studies. Um, sometimes the stories that genomes tell may conflict with indigenous uh, groups' own knowledge about their origins. Um, so and this is something that I study, so I'm very keenly aware of that. Um, in broad strokes, I think there's a lot of common ground to be found between genetics and indigenous knowledge, traditional histories, um, but there may be some conflicts when it comes to the specifics. And so are you, is your community okay with that? And if, if you find conflicts, how do you want to handle that? One model that we try to apply, um, although we haven't actually gotten to the publication phase of much of my research. Um, as I say, it takes a long time. But what we intend to do with the tribes that we work with is present um, interpret both interpretations. So we will have our population histories based on genetics and say, here's what we think is going on. And the tribe, we will solicit elders' perspectives, knowledge holders' perspectives about how they interpret these results as well, and present what the tribe would like us to present, perhaps both. Um, that's a way to do it. There are many other ways, obviously. Um, but I think it's good to think about in advance about how you want to handle this kind of situation. Do you want to put any stipulations on this research? Are there special protocols to be followed by the researchers who are handling the samples from the ancestors' remains? Does a tribal representative want to come into the lab to, um, cl to cleanse the space, to, to pray? Um, before the work or during the work or even afterwards, um, that is something that is important. Researcher, a good researcher will want to know how to be respectful in this kind of work, and we need to know that um, from, from you. And then again, how about interpretations of results? Do you want the tribe or elders or representatives from the tribe to be named as co-authors in publications? I always ask the... the um, the tribes with whom I work, if they want to be co-authors on publications. And so far, nobody has taken me up on this, which I'm a little disappointed by, but I would, it's definitely an option. Um, I think it would be, I think it's cool. I, I'd love to see it when, when you have elders as, as um, authors. Okay, so this is a big one, and I want to spend some time on this. Um, so the DNA extraction, the DNA retrieval process is destructive, but there are products that are left over from that process. So you will have a little bit of um, DNA sample left that is not entirely completely sequenced. You will have um, some byproducts um, from the uh, chemical digestion of the bone or tooth. And so what should be done with that? There are options. You can, it can be thrown away or destroyed. It can be returned to the community to be reburied with the ancestor. Um, what do you want done with that? And what do you want done with the, the DNA itself? So once we have sequenced it, there's still, you know, usually a little bit of, of DNA left in the tube. And, you know, one of the things that geneticists who are trying to do this work in a good way are, are not always clear about it, <laughs> they, they may forget, is to, to say, okay, do you want this back? Do you want the tube of DNA back? Or, or do you want us to keep it for future research? Um, that is something that, that would be helpful to have clarity on. The other thing that I'd like you to keep in mind um, as decision makers or advisors 
is that the process of sequencing DNA, uh, the process of sequencing genomes generates huge amounts of data, huge amounts of co huge computer files. Not every tribe has the server capacity to store these in perpetuity. Universities usually do, but it is important to think about what you want to be done with those data files. Do you want them to be available for future studies by other groups? Presumably, if you've allowed a, a researcher to do this work, you have a trust relationship with them. But keep in mind, they may move from the university, they may retire, they may die. You know, what happens to that data when they are gone? Um, sequencing these genomes is, these genomes are valuable. Their medical researchers are very keen to understand the genetic diversity of smaller populations and the genetic diversity of um, indigenous peoples who have not per historically participated in genetics research. So there's not very much many genomes published. Um, there may be important variants, gen medically related variants, DNA variants that are important to understand diseases. Um, and develop potentially treating drugs, other things like that. So, and population history geneticists like me are interested in understanding the histories and what can these genomes tell us from them. So, and also ancestry testing companies are really interested in Native American DNA, as they call it, because they want to expand their databases. Um, for better or for worse. I won't get into that. Um, so the standard practice in academia, and one which your research partners may push for, is to publish the raw data open access, free for anybody to use. Anybody can do any kind of future research with them. So it's nice. In theory, it benefits the whole community of researchers. It benefits the world. You may want to do that. Um, it allows other labs to confirm or identify problems. It means more researchers can work on more projects. I certainly am a beneficiary of the open access DNA publication. But there are some issues. Some tribes may not be okay with publishing genomes free for anybody to use. They may want to have more control over the data that result. And especially in light of medical research that could potentially produce beneficial drugs that they might profit off, of, right? Is your community going to benefit from that research? Um, is your community going to benefit from treatments? Historically, Native peoples have not. Um, and we know, I think everybody here probably knows of this case of the Havasupai who gave their DNA for their, their blood for research, but then saw no benefits. And in fact, their DNA was used for research on questions that they were not okay with. Um, and that has been a big issue. So um, many communities feel that they should receive some benefit from providing their DNA for research. And that might not be possible under open access models. So this is one indigenous authored publication, actually there's two, um, discussing this in the context of precision medicine um, and also in genomic data in general. I don't really understand what blockchain is, so I'm not gonna try and explain that. That's a thing. Um, <laughs> but I strongly encourage you to read indigenous authored publications about um, data sovereignty if you are interested. And I can provide you with a list if you want. Um, actually, it's in my book too, but not to say you have to buy my book. I'm just saying, I've got a list there. I can pull it for you. Um, furthermore, so a tribe may not be, like I said, a tribe may not be okay with research questions asked of their DNA. So this is something to think about. So there are several different models. There's some options. So you can go with the open access model, um, allow unrestricted access to that DNA, to those DNA sequences. You may, there's a middle ground, so you may also say no access. The, the, I only trust the researchers I'm working with. I've given them very specific parameters, very specific questions they can address. That's it, and that's fine too. I have seen that model before. And then there's kind of a middle ground where the tribe has oversight over the kinds of research that is done with their DNA. They give specific permission to specific researchers um, who come and ask, okay, I want to include these genomes in this kind of study, is that okay? Um, in that case, 
you know, there are a couple of different ways to do it. You can store all the DNA sequences, um, the data files on tribally owned servers and grant access that way. You can hopefully trust the, the researchers you're working with to either you give them parameters and say this kind of research is okay and this is not, you know, and, and make sure that you only you have oversight over this and only allow some people to do this work who are complying with it. Or as a tribe, you may ask that requests come directly to you and you approve or not, and then your research partner will send out the data files if you approve. So there's a lot of different options there. Um, it depends on how much you know, involvement you want directly with that process. Um, but this is a really good thing to think about. I really want you to think about this, please. <laughs> Uh, okay, then there's another option, which I want to highlight, um, which is um, doing the research yourselves. So the Native Biodata Consortium is a an, uh, 501c3 organization, it's a research institute that houses um, indigenous DNA samples and data on tribal land, and they conduct research and they provide ongoing consultation services with tribes. Um, and so this is something to check out a lot of the papers that are about uh, genome, genomic data sovereignty are authored by the folks who, who work through here. And they're lovely, I, I think they're wonderful. Okay, so another thing to think about, how does the community wish to benefit from the research? Um, so we have plenty of examples of research that have, has been done which benefit academics instead of tribes. Um, Thanks to the efforts of bioethicists and um, native activists and scholars, a lot of non-native researchers are finally getting a clue in realizing that this work cannot be done in that way. Um, researchers may be well-intended and want to help, but they don't know what a tribe needs or wants. Um, and so it is helpful to think about this in advance and provide specific asks of a researcher if you can. Um, so, for example, does a community want educational opportunities for the students, for their students, um, internships in, in um, science, in, in research labs for, for, um, for students is, is a definitely something that we can do, we, we, we researchers. Um, does a community want stipends or consultation fees for elders who are helping interpret results? Um, do, does a community want researchers to advocate for a particular issue or initiative on behalf of that tribe, like repatriation? Um, so the more specific you can be, the easier it is for researchers to, to um, help you incorporate these needs into the project design. And all this should be done before a project is submitted for funding. Um, but keep in mind that there are some restrictions from the governmental funding agencies like the National Science Foundation, the National Institutes of Health. There are some things that they cannot fund. So um, just keep that in mind. Okay, so let's talk about using DNA for repatriation really quickly. Um, this article really lays out the issues well. I think it would be, it's, if you're interested, it's definitely a, a, a thing to read. Um, so it tells the story of finding some ancestors in Texas um, on private, privately owned la uh, land, um, and the ancestors' remains were sold. In, some, in one case, in another case, they were just kept um, on display. Um, and because they violated the law in one case, the ancestor was removed from that individual's possession and brought to a museum in Texas. Um, and both that ancestor and the other one had their DNA sequenced in an effort to um, try to help repatriation. And it turned out that these two ancestors, one was 700 years old, one was 900 years old, were maternal relatives of each other. Their mitochondrial DNA sequence matched that of a living man um, who was trying to claim them as lineal ancestors under NAGPRA and have them return to him for reburial. His claim is ongoing. I don't know what will become of it, but DNA has certainly strengthened that claim. So it may result in a good outcome. Um, and I also want to remind everyone the sequencing of the genome of the ancient one, sometimes known as Kennewick man, also strengthened um, the, return, the, the efforts to return his body um, to, to be reburied. So DNA can be used to strengthen repatriation claims, but it's not a simple issue. Um, 
If using DNA in repatriation claims becomes more common, it potentially opens the door to defining indigeneity in genetic terms, which is problematic. Um, it may also privilege DNA as a tool for assessing relationships over cultural um, knowledge um, and traditional knowledge, and that is also a problem. And I say this as a geneticist, I mean, you know. Um, so the other thing I'm concerned about is will the wide, if, if using DNA for repatriation claims becomes common, will this widespread use set an expectation for DNA study in repatriation claims? I don't know that it will, but if it does, what about those tribes for whom DNA research is off the table because of its sacredness? Does that mean that they have less opportunity? Um, and again, also, the results of DNA study may not n match traditional knowledge, traditional cultural, historical knowledge. Um, it can't be reliably used to determine tribal affiliation necessarily. So this, and then we're adding an additional complication of time. So ancestors may potentially, if they're very old, be ancestral to many, many different groups, which can complicate things. So, I worry about using biological criteria, but I also am heartened by any tool that can strengthen repatriation. I don't have an answer here. I want to put this out here for you to talk about. Maybe you can come and tell me what you think. Um, I don't have a good answer. So there's good and bad. Okay, so that was a lot to throw at you all at once. Um, and if you are considering using paleogenomics, you might be wondering just one more thing, how do we choose trustworthy research partners? Um, and this is a tough one. I think it will take a lot of work. Um, so first I would decide what it is you're looking for. Think about those questions that I posed. What are your priorities? Do you want research to be done quickly? In which case a lab like mine is not gonna be your, a good choice for you. Um, do you want research to be more personalized? Do you want the, the, those long-term relationships? In that case, a smaller lab might be more useful for you. Um, they're not mutually exclusive, of course, but um, I would look at the lab webpage and see the kinds of tones that they're setting. You know, what kinds of language are they using? Are they talking about specimens or are they talking about ancestors? Just some, you know, you know how to, you know how to assess that. Um, do they describe their work as engaged or community-based participatory, right? That's a, that's, those are things to look for. And then, of course, ask other tribes and ask archeologists and ask repatriation specialists about their reputation. The ancient DNA community is not very big. Um, and so we all have reputations. Uh, you may be able to learn something about how we carry out our work um, and how people have experienced working with us um, if you ask. Um, and if you trust my opinion and you wanna run somebody by me, I'm happy to, to share it with you confidentially. Um, finally, when you're ready to approach a research partner, see how they react to your expectations. Are they willing to cede a lot of decision-making power to you? Are they making an effort to accommodate your needs? Even if they may not have a perfect understanding of these issues, the intention should be clear. Um, and so one important thing that I think is really crucial is do they understand that consent and consultations are dynamic, ongoing, that perspectives in a tribe may change, if those perspectives change, that they, they must be willing to agree to stop doing the research. And that is a very hard thing, speaking as a geneticist, to, to do, but you have to be willing to do that. Um, so this can all be summed up in this quote from, from geneticist Justin, Dr. Justin Lund, who is a, um, gave a talk for the American Association of Physical, or I guess they were physical back then, physical anthropologists in 2021. We call ourselves biological anthropologists now. Um, he likened the disciplines of genetics and archaeology, archaeology to houses with crumbling foundations, and I really loved that. Um, I think it's perfect. And he advocates for foundational repair by mending relationships with indigenous groups. And he says, creating bad relationships took generations. Mending these relationships will take generations, so plan accordingly. If your work starts and stops in the lab, you're doing it wrong. And I think this is the attitude that you should be looking for in research partners. Okay, finally, I know, finally, finally, I wanna highlight an incredible organization which is dedicated to building capacity for doing genetics research within tribes. 
um, or at least for making informed decisions about genetics, um, and that is the Summer Internship for Indigenous Peoples in Genomics. Um, they are an outstanding group of native and non-native bioethicists and geneticists. Um, they have, every year, they have workshops for students, elders, community members who wish to learn more about, in more depth, about the topics that I discussed here. I've learned so much from them. Um, and so check out their website if you're interested. Apply for a workshop. Tuition is free. They will pay for you to go. Um, and you will get a very good education. But also find fellowship and networking among indigenous geneticists um, and find useful resources for your community. OK, so I want to end on a positive note. Um, the ethical issues in paleogenomics are huge. The challenges are huge. But and, and the history of my field is deeply rooted in colonialism and centuries of exploitation. The results from our research have the potential to deeply impact native communities. We have many examples of problematic research, but we also have good examples too. And researchers are becoming, I promise, they are becoming more sensitive and understanding of these issues. Um, and as non-native researchers in positions of power become more aware they are serving as reviewers for grant proposals, for journal articles, and that is building the structure in academia that is needed to propel this field forward in a good way. An institutional expectation of care for ancestors and scientists' obligations for communities. I have seen changes in this field so much in the last few years, and I want to just let you know about that. We have a really long way to go. We are not where we need to be. There are setbacks, there are bad actors, but we are actually heading in the right direction. I am very positive about this. Um, so empowering tribes as decision makers in this process is the path forward. And I promise you that there are many non-native scientists who want to help with this. So you can find them, um, and there are many people who are willing to help you with this. So. OK, so that's a lot. I have to plug my book a little bit. Um, but here are some ways to contact me if you have any questions. I'm really drowning in emails right now, so it might take me a while to get to you, but I will try. Um, and I want to thank the college, KU College of Liberal Arts and Sciences, my departments for sponsoring my travel, the KU Center of Genomics and NSF for funding, funding my research. These are ways to contact me. Um, and thank you all so much for having me here. It's really been an honor. All right, let's get to some questions. Um, I'd like to ask one, <laughs> um, and, and we have a little bit of time. My, my real interest in, in genetic study comes from the horrible stories that I've learned from archaeology and archaeology theories um, that are connected to whether or not ancestors are related to present day. Indian tribes, right? And so quite often, archaeologists, I love you. How many archaeologists are in the room? You're going to admit to it? OK. <laughs> Great. Thank you. So they take a little bit of information, just a couple of facts, and all of a sudden you have a story of a people's. And I've always been very skeptical of those stories because such little information is involved. So has genetics been able to buttress those stories or take them in a different direction? Do you have any um, particular case studies or anything you want to share about how genetics has amended or completely changed archaeology's theories? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so when I talk about this, I talk about different understandings of the past and how different data sets, different types of data, whether it's archaeological, genetic, biological, or traditional histories, traditional knowledge, um, what those perspectives can give us on the past. And they, I, I, I came up, actually, I didn't come up with this metaphor. My, a friend of mine came up with this metaphor, and, but I use it, which is that these different data sets are like different trees in a forest, right? And so you have different kinds of trees that result from the roots that are grounded in these different types of 
understandings. And sometimes the tree's branches intersect, and sometimes they do not. But a forest is much richer for the trees, for having a variety of trees, right? And so that's the kind of metaphor that I think about. And in fact, you will find that archaeologists, love you guys, but it, this is true, will have very big disagreements about interpretations of different types of archaeological data. So you're maybe using the same data, but you come up with different, um, different ideas about the past. We are all operating in a vacuum of understanding. <laughs> we, you know, um, it, w those of us who are working with archaeological or genetics data, we're limited by the amount of data we have. Um, specifically, when we're talking about genetics, there are places where genetics and archaeology agree. There are places where genetics, archaeology, and traditional histories agree. And it's very cool to see when that happens. Um, I'm thinking, well, I'm thinking specifically uh, of the story that I opened my book with. Um, the story of Shuka Ka, who's an ancient 10,000-year-old man who, um, whose remains were found in a cave on Prince of Wales Island. Um, and his genome showed that he was the ancestor of present-day peoples in that region, even though there had been some question archaeologically about whether that was the case. Although some archaeologists were like, yes, of course. Um, it was very helpful to have that genetic connection. Not that they needed, the tribes needed his DNA to, to demonstrate that, nor he was, and, and I actually opened the book with that story because I think it's a very good example of how a respectful partnership between different groups of scientists and communities can, can go, what it can look like. There was never any question about whose right it was to give permission or refusal for the study of his DNA. But I think it was really um, a cool story because he, his DNA showed that he was ancestral to them, um, and in fact confer affirmed their histories of living in that region for since time immemorial. Um, I think it's extremely cool. Um, there are other, s other aspects of history constructed from archaeological evidence that have been overturned by DNA studies. Um, one of the major issues that I am really interested in is the stories about the initial peopling of the Americas and how that process may have happened or not happened. And although there was this model, and you guys are all familiar with this, that has dominated archaeology for like most of the 20th century of a very recent peopling, um, that model has been overturned by genetics evidence, but also by archaeology. Let me give credit to the archaeologists who have persisted in the face of a major paradigm that really um, stifled a lot of dissenting voices, people finding old sites and saying, look, people were here a long time ago. Um, so the archaeologists actually, in that case, have led the way in many ways. But genetics confirmed that. But I also want to say that um, genetics should not be seen as, I think, sci I worry about the prioritization of scientific evidence over traditional history. And I say this as a scientist, right? I am a scientist. But I want to make sure that we don't think we need to use DNA to confirm tribal histories. Um, I don't think that those histories need to be validated. They're important in and of themselves. So I hope that answered your question. <laughs> We have a question from the chat from Wendy Teeter. What if samples were taken without tribal permission, ignoring NAGPRA, and the data continues to be used without permission? What can a tribe do to stop this practice? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I think that, I think there's a legal component to this. I'm looking at lawyer, <laughs> um, which could help. Um, and I, that I'm not going to touch because I am not a lawyer and I don't know what you could do legally. But um, I would say make noise about it. Um, the current media culture is surprisingly favorable to discussions like this. I mean, not everywhere, obviously, but there are journalists if you go to them, they are listening, um, and I can give you I can give you pointers, um, and they will do a good job on these stories. Um, and then talk to the folks at Sing. They are really active in this space, and indigenous geneticists, indigenous archaeologists are really um, doing a lot 
in this space. And those of us who are trying to do things better, those of us non-natives who are trying to do things better are listening. Um, and it's important for us to know what's going on. Um, and so, yeah, I would just say, I guess that's not much of an answer, but I, um, reach out to, to folks and let us know and um, make noise about it. And it, it, I think it will make a difference. Hello, um, my name is Raylan Williams. I'm from the Gila River Indian community and I have a couple of questions. My first question is you talked about the DNA samples and that they can be reused for research. What is the lifespan of that sample? Oh, that is a good question. How long, I mean, I think they can last a long time, decades certainly, so. Okay. I, I, yeah, this is a fairly recent field, so I don't actually know how long, but um, they can certainly last for decades before the DNA is degraded, too degraded. Well, it's already degraded, but yeah. Okay, because we um, were previously consulted on um, paleo feces, mm. and it was brought to our attention that the lifespan of that DNA research is, is minimal, hmm. like it doesn't last very long. I mean, I think it kind of depends on how the DNA is stored, because in certain chemical conditions it can, can last a while. Um, I guess I'd need to hear some more specifics before I could advise you, but I'm happy to talk about it more if you want. Yeah, yeah. that would be good to okay. know, because for other tribal communities to understand how long a sample lasts mm -hmm. in these research facilities. Um, they can that, last a long time. Yeah. because. Yeah, yeah. Um, for future generations, they need to be advised on how the tribal communities um, have given the permission to store the samples. Mm -hmm. My other question is, um, knowing, um, is there a way to find out um, any previous DNA research that was done on ancestors from tribal communities that did not have tribal um, consent? Mm -hmm. Is there a way to find that out? Um, yeah, so if you look in the genetics literature, and you might want to get somebody you know, to do this for you, you can always, you know. The, um, y if you look in the genetics literature, that, so if the study has been published, it will be there, and you can find it. Um, if, it has not been published, it becomes more tricky, and you have to kind of retrace the history of, okay, what scientists came to do, collect the samples, and then you can go to that institution and ask them, are our samples there, right? I will say your questions are related, and um, it is a discussion that a lot of geneticists are having right now. What do we do about these samples that were collected ages ago? whatever the consent structure looked like back then, they certainly shouldn't be used now for more research, and so what do we do about that? That is something that I've had discussions with some folks here already um, since coming here, and we're having these discussions back at our universities, and so I expect there is gonna be more work done on this in the future, but I think it starts with you tribes knowing where your DNA samples are, right? And they may have been moved from the original institution. Um, I wonder if NAGPRA coordinators could help with that. I don't know. Um, but yeah. yes, so a literature search is, is definitely the first place to start and then understand that there may be some studies that have not been published and in which case, you know, you're gonna have to do a little more digging and, and, and potentially the NAGPRA coordinators can help with that, I don't know. Okay, and then I have one final comment and I'm glad that you um, said this, that the DNA research does not, um, give someone their tribal affiliation. Because um, uh, 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 my community, we do cultural sensitivity presentations, and a few times I, we've been approached after the presentation and saying, oh, I did a DNA uh, <laughs> test, and it told me I was Native American, and. I had to tell them that, well, that doesn't prove anything because tribal, tribal affiliation is through your family lineage and your connection to the community. 
and every time their face just drops yeah, because yeah. they try to find a connection yeah. and it's like it's through your family because many families can remember up to six generations mm -hmm. and that's the importance of tribal affiliation thank you yeah thank you that's such a good point i um you know i, I struggle with talking about this because i'm not native and i do not have these the positionality to talk about this but um all I will say, because there are complicated, I know there are complicated issues about reconnection and, and such, but all I can say is that no geneticist has any right to say who is native and not native. So I'll just leave that. We, I, I'm drawing that line right there. <laughs> I can do that. <laughs> so. Hiya. Oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, I'm Dr. Paul Edward Montgomery Ramirez. I'm with uh, Cleveland State University. I'm also um, a Mone Moseño Chorrotega from Nicaragua. Uh, so uh, talking about the uh, peopling of the Americas, um, I do writing and talking on um, topics within white supremacy mm -hmm. on that. And uh, you are very well aware of those. I know I've cited you several times. Oh, thank you. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so I thought I, I wanted to bring out um, the recent move of considering genetics in the very, very widely dismissed Salutrian hypothesis. Oh my God. I know, I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, to, uh, that there was a uh, First Nations community that was uh, consulted on this for approach to have DNA, uh, ancient DNA work done, and how exactly they felt they were represented by, because there was that um, uh, documentary in uh, Canada. A oh, was that the years. one I was in? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah that, was, that was fun. <laughs> yeah, that was a, that was a trip. Yeah. Um, so yeah, just how they felt that this worked with or against uh, indigenous causes and um, by you know having their DNA research being okay. used in such a mm, dubious kind of way. Okay, I'm not going to answer your question because it's a good <laughs> one, but I can't speak for that tribe. I have no idea. Sure, sure, I have sure. no idea. I have no idea. So that's that, that's fair. Yeah, I can't. Um, but I will. So some people may be like, "What are you talking about?" So I will give you some general that's why, introduction. That's why I wanted to yeah. bring it up. <laughs> let me let me talk about the Salutrian hypothesis real quick, and I will get myself um, uh, trolled on Twitter like crazy now. But that's okay. Um, so the Salutrian hypothesis is this idea, it started out as a scientific hypothesis based on like archeological evidence that was pretty shaky of these, I, um, I'm not a lithicist, so somebody in this audience I know can explain this better than I can, but these similarities in design and manufacture between Clovis points, which are these, you know, of course, extremely old, 13,000 year old, projectile points on the ends of spears, and points that are seen in um, uh, the Salutrian culture, which isn't like in France and Spain, okay? And there's some similarities, superficial similarities between them, but like most of the archeologists, almost every archeologist I know who's an expert in lithics is like, no, they're just, it's just convergent technologies. There's no connection between them. They're totally different time periods. And there's no evidence that people came across the Atlantic Ocean. And the idea, the implication of this theory is that the first Clovis toolmakers were actually Europeans, were actually from the Salutrian culture. And I just say, there is zero genetic evidence of this. Absolutely none. Not a shred. Not a shred of genetic evidence that the first peoples in the Americas were anything other than the ancestors of indigenous peoples. Um, they, some people have tried to make a claim that the mitochondrial haplogroup X is somehow, but it's it's weak. I, I have a paper on it, whatever. Um, okay, so there's no genetic evidence of that. And in fact, when the genomes uh, of um, the very, the only indigenous, the only um, known people who have been buried with Clovis tools, the only known ancestors is this child from the ANSIC site. Um, and his genome, um, it shows that he's not. Salutrian, he's not European, he has no European ancestry. 
Um, so that's what I went on this documentary to try to explain, and it was pretty clear that they had an agenda. Um, they wanted to tell the story uh, of a you know dramatic transatlantic crossing of a small group of people who then you know, but it's just nonsense. And I think any legitimate archaeologist these days will probably agree. I'm, I hope there's nobody here who's you know, anyway. I'm going to get myself in trouble. I'm going <laughs> to shut up. I but I don't know what what the deal is with you know any you know, tribe that participated in that. I'm not, I, I can't comment on that because I'm not privy to their ideas, so, yeah. Fair enough, and thank you for letting me poke yeah. the bear on that one a bit. <laughs> thank you. Can we all give a hand for Dr. Jennifer Rapp? Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> yes, NAGPRA, the law does not require um, any kind of uh, additional study. Uh, Deborah Harry has a quick question. Yeah, Jennifer, Jennifer come back. <laughs> go ahead and go ahead. Uh, thank you. Sorry, I was a little bit late. Um, Jennifer, um, I'm really interested in following up on Wendy Teeter's question. I feel like. You didn't quite answer it in oh, details. Um, and of course, I mean, what we're talking about is genetic samples from ancient DNA, which is our oldest ancestors, mm -hmm. and that's your field of study. And, you know, you, you, you suggested to someone to follow the literature. And uh, there's not that many who are doing this kind of research. I mean, I can name a lot of the names, like your own Bolnick, Malhi, mm -hmm. <laughs> O'Rourke, you know. Mm -hmm. um, the, the, the names that come to mind. Um, so I think that you can give us more detail in terms of what samples you all are using. What samples we have? What, what samples you all are using oh. in your research. Oh, that's published in the literature. How many of okay. them are mm -hmm. consented or not? Mm -hmm. For instance, I know, you know, the Kennewick man samples were not consented. They were ordered by a judge. Um, and then where are those samples kept? How do you access them? How many have had cell lines derived from the original samples? And where are those kept? Who has access to them? How do we know who's using them? And then where is the data kept from those samples? And who has access to the data? Mm -hmm. OK, I'll start with the last. That's great questions. I don't think I can answer all of them. But um, the last, I'll start with the last question first. The data for. Most of these ancestors were published open access, so they will be stored on the servers of the folks who did the sequencing, and probably the last author of the publication would have those, I'm guessing. So, for example, um, who did it? Okay, so the person who sequenced the ANSIC genome would be the Reich Lab, I think, and so I think that David Reich's lab has most of these. Um, the other major player in this field who has a majority of the ancient uh, individuals sequenced is Eski Willerslev. And so the majority of data sets would be on his server. Um, the other, as far as the actual tubes containing DNA, those would also be in those labs. Um, we have our own as well. Um, but they're not generally, when we're talking about these big ancient ancestor papers, um, the, the ancient one, his DNA, I don't know, was sequenced by Eski Willerslev's lab. It's, I would imagine it was returned with his remains. I hope it was returned with his remains. I don't know. Um, his genome is maintained on a secure server, I believe, by the Willerslev lab but it is restricted access. So I think you have to get permission in order to use it, and it's the permissions certain, are tied to certain questions, I think. Um, the rest of your question about like every single specific individual, that I cannot answer because it's a big question, and it's a good question. I can give you a list, not right this second, but of what we have and who we are working with and what we're doing, um, but the majority of these big papers with these big samples that um, everybody is aware of, those would be housed in those individual researchers' labs. Okay, um, so one question then is um, you, sent, you talked about permission, but permission from whom? Do you go back to the tribes to get permission for every 
It depends on every use? case. Yeah, if they're published open access, then yeah. no. And that's why I raise this issue. I think that this is something that tribes need to think about. Do you want your ancestors' DNA sequences published open access, or do you want to restrict it? So. And then, then the last thing I would say is that all of these things require destructive analysis of, of our ancestors, and that it, the way that it's presented is that, um, and it's not re required under NAGPRA uh, as, as a form of evidence. Correct. But the, the, the concern I have is the weight that you present genetics in that it is as if it is um, validatable because it's, it's not really, because um, it contributes to a body of work and, and findings, but in and of itself, it cannot be validatable in, in terms of determining identity. Yes, I agree with you. It is not, a, and, I, it does, and I have that line in there, DNA does not tell you about identity. Um, I think there are a variety of perspectives on the validity of DNA use and whether or not one should be doing um, destructive analyses. And I respect the tribes that say no, and I'm trying to encourage my fellow scientists. Many of them do respect that as well, but some don't understand it. Um, and so I think that this is a, an area where a lot of indigenous uh, leadership has been really important, including your own, in, in making people, non-native scientists, aware of why this is so important to understand. So thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you again. Uh, thank. Yes, sir. My English name is Clarence Surrett. I belong to the Batchwana Band First Nation of Ojibwe, Ontario, Canada. And I, along with Bo Cagas, we've been involved in this situation since the, the late 80s, before NAGPRA became a law in 95. But what I'm hearing from Hugh is what we've heard back then. Give us a little more time with your people, with the DNA or whatever, and we'll give it back. And so we, as Native people, we've been listening to this for years. Because we believe in our way of life, you know, that things that are taken from our people, the journey cannot continue. And so we see that our way of life, our traditions is not being honored because it's being overruled by, well, the dominant culture. And I understand there's probably some people in here who have been assimilated into the dominant culture and forgot their traditions of their people. I haven't. I speak here for my ancestors and the ones before me. The people that you have, be it in DNA, or be it in boxes in all these museums and all these universities and whatsoever, all we ask is that you give them back to us so that we can put them back in Mother Earth from once they came. And I understand it's hard for you guys to understand these things. People call us the vanishing race, but we are still here today. And we will continue to be here. I had this one elder tell me a long time ago, when me and him was doing a presentation to the archaeologist, anthropologist of Michigan State University. He said, a lot of people think that we came across that barren strait. And he told them at this time, and they didn't like it, he said, you know what? You said you saw footprints coming from that area to here, to North America. He said, so you think we came from over there? He said, but you want to know something? He said, we taught our people how to walk backwards to make it look like we came from over there. Our people have come from this Turtle Island. And we've been here for thousands upon thousands upon thousands upon thousands of years. And when I was listening, I thought I was going to get tired and fall asleep over there. But the more and more I sat and listened, the more and more I awoke. Studying our DNA 
trying to figure out where we came from, we know where we come from. We come from this place called Turtle Island. We don't need to know where we come from. And sometimes I talk about this thing. Archaeologists, anthropologists, they want to know these things. And I've heard some of them on TV say, well, there's people, the native people, indigenous to this place here in the United States, North America, or even South America, they were originally here. They came across from the Barren Strait. So when they come to this land, they wasn't really their land. Somebody else had it before them. Our traditions tell us otherwise. That we've been here for thousands upon thousands upon thousands of years. And every year it seems like we get a little thing, you know, like a, a roadblock put in our way. I heard yesterday we were talking about consultation. Well, we get to set up a consultation with each tribe to find out what they want. We'll get together for one month, and then we'll go to our next month, and we go to our next month, we go to our next month, and in 10, instead, the remains remain there. Back in 1992, I had this friend of mine, his name was James Ryden Inn. He was a Pawnee. He came to Lansing Community College, and we talked about this issue. He was, he was a very radical dude. Because he also said he had part in this NAGPRA thing. He was a professor, I think, at Arizona State University. And he was against what was going on. And we talked about these things, what's going on with our ancestors. And when I think the little push and shove that you give us all the time, that's more for your part, because that's your living. We don't believe in that way. And if the people in this audience who have forgotten who you are, you need to think about that one way or the other. We are Anishinaabek people. We're indigenous to this Mother Earth here called Turtle Island. And when I think about our people, sometimes our people get involved in a dominant culture. And they forget who they are. And I think about the time up there in Minnesota, Wisconsin area, when they were fighting over the fishing rights. There were stickers up there saying, save a walleye, spear an Indian. And at that time, back in the 80s and 90s, our people had, up in that area, the Ojibwe people up in that area, they had 100% fishing rights. And once they went, to the courts and stuff like that, we only got 50% 50 right, 50% 50, 50 fishing rights, and everybody celebrated. Oh my God, we got that. And I used to think, I said, why are you celebrating? You had 100% and now you only got 50%. And sometimes our people, you know, we do this because we get caught up in this area. And I by no means am a racist. I respect all other ways of life. But when it comes to my ancestors, they date back thousands and thousands of years. And what is being done to them when the graves are dug up, and then once the DNR gets a hold of them, we have a heck of a time getting them back. We have to fight with the universities, as you well know. And to me, that's not right. And that joke I made yesterday, and I, I didn't get too many people laughing about it, and that told me a lot that a lot of our people here are caught up in that university stuff. I myself, I do not have a PhD. I once had an elder tell me he had a PhD, and it was called, he said he was a post hole digger. We have knowledge of life. And that joke I said yesterday, and I'll say it again, when I walked into that room and me and Dan Pine was there before I was there, and the room was filled with archaeologists and anthropologists, and we're to discuss what we are talking about now. I came in 10 minutes late. 
And I got up there and I said, all right, what do you guys want me, on a table or on the floor? Didn't get no laughter in here, so it tells me about where some of your people's mindsets are at. To me, that was one heck of a joke. And I knew that the archaeologists and the policies there, they ain't gonna say anything, they just sit there and they go, oh my God, you know. Because they want us to be passive. They want us to be this way so that you can do what you want to do with our remains. And I know that NAGPRA is a good organization and they're trying to do their best they can. But how long do we have to wait to get our people back? So we can put them back in the mother earth from once they came. And so their journey can continue. I'm telling you right now, I myself, I know where I came from. And so when I hear this, I get a little upset. Very upset. And at that meeting we had with the archaeologists and anthropologists, I said, why don't you go dig your own people up? Go to their cemeteries, go dig them up and study theirs and check their DNA out. Find out where part of the world they come from. Leave our people alone. We know where we came from. And that's all I have to say as being a national big ninny. I'm a spiritual leader and an elder. And sometimes our people get, they don't know what to say because they are caught up in this university. They are caught up in the dominant culture and they don't want to upset their friends who are in the dominant culture. But I speak the truth, and our people need to come together and say, we want our people back so we can put them back in Mother Earth from once they came. Jim McGuetch. Thank you. I'm sorry, but we're, gonna, we're running really behind and we need to move on. This is a really wonderful, healthy discussion. This is why we're having these discussions so that we can talk. And I appreciate Dr. Jennifer Raff being with us today to talk about what questions you all need to ask your tribes, your nations, and how you interact with researchers and how we can better advocate in this field to protect our DNA if we want it protected or to learn more if that's what our tribes and our uh, descendants want. Thank you very much.